Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about making learning learner centric and how this may actually hold the key to unlocking human potential. Human beings are extremely curious and we love to learn. We have an unquenchable thirst for learning. In fact, learning and survival are very closely linked, which led Deming to say that learning is not compulsory, neither is survival. In fact, when you think about it, we spend enormous amount of time learning through the course of our lifetime. Enormous amount of learning. But unfortunately, we don't spend enough time thinking about how we learn and what we learn. Because the learning system is not really learner-centric. And I want to talk to you about how the world could be very different if we created an environment where the learner is in charge of learning. So let me introduce this character, William Shakespeare. Long ago, he uh, spoke about this, all words are stage and all of us are actors. I have a little modern twist to it. I like to think that all words are game and we are all players. I'm not referring to the Abhishek Bachchan movie here. <laughs> we are all players. Think about it. What is a school system after all? It's a long, elongated game where you put in some effort, you get a reward in the end. You have different levels, you have competition, all game elements. What is a business after all? It's a massively multiplayer game. Even if you're a monopoly, that's a single player game. What's a marriage after all? For some of us, it's an adventure fantasy game, and for others, it's a game of cat and mouse, depending on how your luck goes. So gaming is a fundamental part of all of us. It's been with us for a very long time. It's one of the oldest forms of social interaction. We codify our worldviews and ideas of, about the world around us in our games, and it gets translated from one generation to the next. Now, where are we in uh, the context of games today? We have evolved quite a lot. Today, we have immersive, real life like games. And I'm sure you can relate to all of these games on the screen. What is the first one? Candy Crush. Unbelievable number of downloads. 500 million plus downloads have happened so far. One of the most successful games ever. Then you've got World of Warcraft. About 100 million plus downloads over the so many over so many years. Did you know that an average World of Warcraft player spends about six and a half hours every day on this game? It's almost like full-time profession, right? And Farmville, of course, we are familiar with Farmville, one of the first popular games on Facebook. Why am I talking about gaming here? I believe that gaming and adding a gaming layer to learning can make it personalized and can unlock human potential. Now what got me thinking is the digital natives. We have these kids now growing up on digital technologies. The way they learn is extremely different from the way we are learning or we have learned in the past. We are all the digital immigrants and these kids are the digital natives. It comes like second nature to them. And the root shock happened to me when my daughter almost beat me in the game of Elevate, right? So the Elevate app. And my two-year-old son can uh, recognize and identify up to 50 logos of car brands. While I'm proud as a dad, I'm ashamed that I don't know about 20 of them myself. <laughs> and I can clearly see where this is headed. And it's sort of prompted me to ask this question, they seem to be on an accelerated path. They seem to have something that we did not enjoy as kids, and that is learner-centric system. Today they have an iPad, an iPhone, where they are able to, in their own time and space, explore and learn at their own pace. This is a luxury that we did not have. So that leads me to this question. The nation wants to know, could it be true that the more we get educated, <laughs> the lesson we actually seem to learn, could this be true? Because I see human potential right in front of my eyes, the couple of kids that I have, and I'm sure you have kids in your family, 
that are doing astonishing feats at this point in time. But what happens when we grow up? Something strange seems to be happening. We seem to be learning lesser and lesser. So what's the answer to this question? It really depends on the learning system. If you really think about the learning system that we've gone through, it is not learner-centric. It has never been. So now, let me explain that. So there are two schools of thought here. One is called pedagogy, which is, which is methods and systems of education that are targeting kids. And andragogy, which is methods and systems that are focusing on education of adults. Right? Now, what, why is there a difference in the first place? Adults are supposed to be self-directed. They know what they want. They have a problem-solving mindset. They have experience that they can rely on to aid in their learning process, where kids are supposed to not have any of this. That's our conventional wisdom, right? But today what we see is because of digital, kids are getting access to andragogy and adults are stuck with pedagogy. Can you relate to that? Think about the classroom we sit in. Are you in the control? You are not. The professor is in the control. The content is the key. Content is very important, the process of learning is very important, the learner comes second. Now why did we end up with this kind of a system? There was a good reason for this. If you go back in time, the last 150 years, we managed to industrialize learning and there was a good reason why we had to do this, because we had to ramp up our skill, you know, skill base, create a workforce that was industry ready. And the best way to do this was to have the so-called expert stand in front of people, deliver a lecture, the content gets transmitted to X number of people and they faithfully reproduce this in the exam. So that's our education system, right? So it worked well to a certain extent. In the bar game, what has happened is the learner's experience, the true experience of learning and discovering oneself through learning doesn't happen in the system. Now, some of you may be familiar with the poem's learning cycle. Right? This says that you know people learn using a variety of senses, right? Essentially, we learn through our eyes, we observe, we learn by doing the hands, we think and we feel. Think about it in our classrooms of today, what are we actually doing? We are targeting our entire learning to the head. Nothing happens to your heart, nothing happens to your hand. Right? And we are expecting people to become managers or leaders or whatever they want to become just by watching PowerPoint slides. That is not going to work. Right? So we are badly in need of learner-centric systems. And how do you measure learning effectiveness? Some of you may, may know of this as well, the Kirkpatrick's four uh, levels of learning effectiveness. It starts with the evaluation of reaction. How happy do you feel at the end of this workshop or training program? When I ask one of uh, my industry contacts in the learning and development space what ensures success of learning, guess what this person said? Venue and menu. <laughs> learning, the facilitator, the content has no role to play, unfortunately, right? How do we change that system? Because learning is crucial for our survival. Learning is something that we crave for, but unfortunately our system doesn't support it. Now let me uh, talk about a few myths and assumptions on which our current learning system works. Assumption number one, the sage on stage will take you to the promised land. Right, so this has worked for a long time, but I don't think it will work anymore. Why? Because there's a German psychologist by name Robin Ebbinghaus. He has done fantastic work around the way memory works. He is the person who has come up with this term called learning curve. I'm sure you've heard of learning curve. He is also the same person who came up with this term called forgetting curve. Ironically, we've forgotten that part. Right? We only remember the learning curve. And what he says is, if you listen to somebody speak in a setting like this, you know what, 40 minutes from now, what percentage of whatever I spoke right now, would you have forgotten? Any guesses? 80 percent. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so he's saying that in about an hour, about 56% just evaporates from our minds. We know this. 
right? This is how we are wired. But somehow, in our traditional learning system, we expect people to sit for eight hours in front of the facilitator and expect this person to absorb and remember everything that happened. It's not going to happen. Confucius says, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I learn, right? So while you can have a sage on stage to make you aware, ultimately your true deep learning happens when you do it, right? And that's somehow missing in our learning system. Learning assumption two, or the myth that I want to talk about is content trumps everything else. In the pedagogy method, content in the process of disseminating this content to the learner is number one. But we know that uh, in today's times, because of technology, content can be dealt with outside of the classroom. So when you come to the classroom, what is most important is facilitated practice. So this is what is called as the flipped classroom. Back in the day when we did homework, what was that all about? You learn a concept in class, but you go home and you do your practice. But today, we are flipping that over. Content gets done outside and classroom is used for facilitated practice. But somehow, this is still not in practice even today. Learning assumption number three, a day-long training program produces learning magic. Again, a myth, right? This, is, this cannot be true. Because we know that for deep learning to happen, new neural, uh, new neural pathways have to be formed, new habits have to, have to be formed, and we need feed, feedback, reinforcement, and percolation of learning to happen for behaviors to change. And learning assumption number four, classroom is a place where most learning actually happens. I have a bunch of students in front of me. What do you think about this? Sorry? It's an assumption, right? So now, while the classroom is great for generating awareness, what is also important is the context of learning. When you are reading a book, it's not just the content that goes into your head, it is also the context. And that's so important for the way we remember that content and the way we will access it for a period of time. <coughs> Alright, so I spoke about the problems, I, I spoke about the uh, issues, the myths that uh, surround our current learning system. How can we change it? We can change it by adding a layer of gaming around learning and make it learner-centric. How do we do that? First thing, let's start with the vision. In the future, the classroom will learn the student. For the last how many number of years, we've been learning in the classroom, but going forward, the classroom will learn us. That's how learners and things are going to be. How will we achieve it? Firstly, we need to generate a lot of engagement with the learners. They need to actively participate. Second is you generate a lot of analytics around what people do in the learning system and produce a learning path that is customized for them. So what do we need to know? The game layer or gamification as we call it is not really about games, it is about the learner. It is not about knowledge, it is about behavior. It is about constant feedback and it is also about a clear goal. Without all of this, any learning system is bound to fail. So how do we program the brain for better learning? Couple of things. Number one, based on neural science, what we do know is there is something called storage strength and there is something called retrieval strength. How do we promote better learning and enhance the potential with the brain? You need to do accurate memory representation. Whatever you learn, you represent it in a way that the brain can understand, leveraging on past experience. And you also promote retrieval of that information. Second is dopamine. So this is that magic chemical that gets produced in our minds when we are having fun, when we achieve something. So using a combination of these two, we can create a system which energizes learners and produces durable learning over a period of time. I'm going to just talk about very quickly five gamification principles that can be put to great use to make learner-centric systems. Number one, habit principle. What is this all about? I'm sure some of you have used the Elevate app. It gives you a calendar. It's as if you have a daily appointment with this particular app. If you don't do it, you feel bad about it. Right? And uh, my wife used to be uh, an ardent fanatic, ardent fan of uh, the Fishwell game. How many of us have played Fishwell? None of us. Okay. So somehow, I couldn't understand this because 
Every evening, she had to feed the fish. She had to clean her aquarium. Without that, this digital fish will die. It was her moral responsibility to do this. And that basically got my head. Right? I don't have starving like her, but... <laughs> That's how powerful, that's how powerful gamification principles can be if done well. Second is a reward principle. This is connected to the dopamine. Whenever you get a reward, you feel good about it. You want to do it again. And that's what sets off this habit loop and creates new behaviors. Dropbox, for those of you who have used it, will know that they give you additional storage if you complete a set of tasks. What is that? They are rewarding you for certain behaviors. Progress principle. I'm sure many of you are using LinkedIn. They show you a progress bar saying you are 75% complete or 50% complete. We don't like to feel incomplete as human beings. We'll do whatever it takes to become complete. Right? So this is understanding of human psychology and making use of technology to channel life behavior. And this is a fantastic one. Using the story principle to influence and motivate people. So there is an app called Zombies Run. So while no, uh, Nike has an app for uh, gamifying running, it's a plain simple app which gives you points, patches and leaderboards. This one takes it to a different level. What it tells you is, you've got to run for your life, zombies are after you. Right? If you slow down in your running or you slow down in your pace, the zombies will eat you up and you have to start from scratch. Right? So that is elevating this whole experience to a storytelling level that motivates people. And finally, feedback. This is one thing that is solely missing in our traditional learning system. We all need individualized feedback to learn and grow to excel. So that's again something that we can learn from the game layer. By the way, they send those personalized feedback elements that channelize behavior. So in quick summary, all words again, we need to make use of advancements in neuroscience and game development to create learner-centric systems. Learner-centric systems are very, very important for unlocking human potential. I am flying back to Bangalore this night. Tomorrow, I am sure I will be challenged by my daughter on Kartaro. So that is the classic clash between the digital natives and the digital immigrant. So wish me luck. <laughs>